initiatives and the learning that our students and our teachers are engaged in in the district. I've asked Dr. Will Parker uh, to join us today uh, to speak on <coughs> the whole idea of improving student learning by asking more questions and facilitating that kind of in-depth. Uh, most of you know that Dr. Will Parker has been a partner uh, with us here in the district for really about five years now. And Dr. Parker has been a very important component of the work that we have been doing in the district as it relates to um, differentiation, as it relates to the whole movement of the National Board for Professional Education Standards core propositions, and what it means to be an accomplished teacher. And why this is so valuable is because the orchestration of all these wonderful practices is critical to improve student learning. We all know that to make the biggest impact on student learning, we must make the greatest impact with our teachers. So with that said, I'm going to turn over for the next uh, probably 15, 20 minutes a snippet of what he has been teaching us and sharing about student learning in our district. Dr. Will Parker. <coughs> He's fascinating, isn't he? Wow. Give him a hand. <laughs> One of the youngsters that we see every day, and do we miscalculate him? We find him fascinating. I find when I share this with my colleagues, they, they have that bottom jaw drop. But when does that bottom jaw drop for you, him in mathematics, in social studies, in reading, and in science? If a child can listen to a tune, um, and as, as those of us who are musicians in the room, and sing on pitch, know the intervals, expressively know the words, that's a mathematician. If that child can also know the meanings of those words and relate them to himself, that's a sociologist. But yet we don't spend enough time finding this child fascinating. So to improve learning and to look at what we're doing today, I want to ask you some questions. Very simple questions because we are the adults in these children's lives. You have that child in your classroom, but you must figure out how to get to where he is right now. Because quite often, it's not that we can't find children fascinating. It's just that we're not sure what to do with the questions that are running in our heads when we see those children. You see these questions before, and you deal with these questions on a daily basis. How do we help students have a better opportunity in our classrooms? How do we help them to move forward? How do we help children who are always behind and trying to catch up and have been disconnected between learning and, and teaching? Away from our process as, way, as well as away from who we are as an individual. These questions resonate in our mind every day and we wrestle with them. But in order to answer these questions, you have to ask more questions. 
And you ask yourself, what are those questions? The first question has to be is that these children are fascinating. You know those faces. You've seen those faces, and you know those faces very well. They may be some of your students. Actually, these are some of your students. And what's most important is that we need to find them fascinating on your watch. Quite often when I deal with teachers around the country, when they say to me that the child can't do, and I ask the very next question, what would you do if that was your child? How would you teach it then? So the idea is that we have to find another level of care and another level of understanding that says that we must see our children as fascinating. You say, Parker, fascinating. Hmm. What does that mean? Take a pick. Every word there that you see has a compelling place for children. Every subject that you teach, you must find out where it reaches that child in that place. Enthralling, engaging. We use that word all the time. Is your classroom engaging? Are the kids connected? But these are the words you should look for when you're talking about what you're teaching. Not how well they're on task or completing a task, but how deeply are they committed to those individuals. You saw the young man singing. He was committed to those words. His body started to move. He knew when to swell and when to soar. That's what you want them to do with your language. Because if you think about it, when you teach the subject that you care about the most, that's how you feel, like he was singing. My literature teacher's out here. I know what it means for you to get a kid to read and then get those words right. My math teacher, you know that computation is really, really difficult. But when they're committed to it and they can relate to it, that's when they're getting it done. So it's about seeing themselves in that very different way. So these words here will help us. Choose one. Take it with you today and start tomorrow to say that I'm going to find every child spellbounding. I'm going to find every child enthralling. And those are words that go on your word board. Not the ones that are the usual suspects. These are unusual suspects because you want the children to develop a sense of knowing about themselves. Once he can see himself as enthralling, he becomes or she becomes an incredible student for you. So with that said, we go to the basis of what I want to share with you today. It's about the behaviors of adults and the thinking of adults that creates a mindset. And a mindset kind of shifts your behavior. A mindset will tell you how to respond and how not to respond. A, a mindset will tell you how much risk you will take when dealing with a group of children or how much risk you won't take because you don't want to set them up for failure. But when you lose the ability to test the risk that a child can take, you set them up for future failure because you haven't given him the ability to unpack what's in front of him. Think about the, the gifted children that we work with every day. They have the ability to unpack unknown data in a way that's really fascinating. But when our little kids who, one of my, my as my vocal is here, when he sees a, a math problem, he sees the difficulty in the math problem not the ability to unpack it so that it makes relationships to who he is. Not understanding intervals are nothing but fractions. Not understanding that the beats are what we call equivalent fractions, but understanding it in a way that makes sense for this child. And it's about us looking at these questions that make sense for us. So, this, so once we move from teacher behavior, and in that behavior, right, wrong, or indifferent, it instantly creates a student response. But what we're hoping that the student response is that it's going to help children to make meaning, create relationships, and bring connections together. Because that's what the big idea is about. Not what do you know and what you can do. What relationships can be made from what I've taught you? When can I use it again? And when is it important for me? Those are the big responses you want from children. And then and only then do you ask, what is the evidence of student learning? Because once a child has made a response that shows meaning to him, it is no longer about the right answer. It's about how you take that information and use it differently. It's kind of like innovation. You want kids to be innovative in their thinking. What is the profile of an excellent third grader here in your district? What is the profile of an excellent 11th grader in your district? And the first thing should be that that learner is fascinating because of the complexities of their lives, because of the things that's going on in their lives, they bring a sense of onus and oneness to themselves that makes sense for them. And some of you all fight every day to bring that picture to view, to view for those children. And we have to help all of our colleagues fight that hard. But we can't bring that to the table if we're not asking the right question.
questions. We need to start asking the right questions. We haven't even shared what those questions are yet. But we have to get ourselves on a path where we know that our behavior is going to create a response in a child that will promote learning. And you have to say that learning looks like engagement, ownership, accountability, freedom to express. That's what our vocalist was doing. He had ownership of that song. He understood what it meant. He had the freedom to express. He chose when to take a breath. He didn't care what the music said. And he also had an engagement that engaged you. So the key is that when children can do that in classrooms or outside of classrooms, when do we give them an opportunity to do that in classrooms? How often do you think his teacher will let him do that? Not to entertain, but to, to show that he can actually bring every subject to fruition with his thinking, with his acting, with his ability to see. And a lot of times um, when you see children in what I call urban settings, and we only call them urban because of their complexities in their lives, they come with a lot of talent. That's how they keep their time going. When you talk to children who are in areas, they have a lot of time to develop their talent. And if your talent hasn't replicated itself or transcended itself into learning, you haven't tapped into that child. Because quite often, and as we do the research and, t and show it, um, children of color, young children of color, are always pushed into athleticism. Not to that, that it's a place where you, you're not going to be happy where you are, but there must be a, a thinker along with that talent. That's what coaches do. They put thinking with talent. In our classrooms, we are devoid of talent. We just want to know who you, how you're going to get the right answer. But you have to figure out what their talent is to push them to get to that place. That's what shows up in that last column, that student learning, that ability to engage himself so that my talent shows up as well as the ability to engage myself in content. With that said, what's most important is that it's about accomplished teaching. It is the mindset of an adult that says that I will do everything possible to push a child to have a productive life. And that productive life may not look like what it looks like for my children or children in my neighborhood or what it looks like for that child. And you have to develop that ability for that child to see himself as fascinating in that process. We use the word accomplished in front of teaching because when you think of accomplished, you think of someone who's done something very well, done it for a long time, has done all the things. An accomplished musician has sung all the, all the possible music that they can sing, an accomplished pianist, an accomplished athlete, an accomplished actor. But an accomplished teacher knows what to do with a child when he or she is in a position to push him further. And it's not about a right answer, but it's understanding that level of talent that brings that right answer to the classroom. So my first question for you is, who do we teach? What do you know about that young man? You know that, whoa, he can sing. He's not pitchy, as they say. But he can sing. And the key is that, does that help you to do anything else with him in the classroom? So when you ask yourself who was in the classroom, it's not just the data that you use to determine where he will be on the scale, but where is he right now without you trying anything? Where have you tapped into his talent and ability so it shows up as an asset and not a deficit? How often do we use data to determine where they will be on the plotted graph or below the plotted graph? So, or when are you going to use that data to say, this is where we are, this is what we have to do, and this is how we're going to move you? So it's always important about moving in a direction so it's a forward direction, an asset model. You can't see our children coming to our classrooms as half empty. Because what we want to do is, is get, get into a position where we hear all the right answers, but know what it took to get there. The second who is understanding how the child thinks. When you give them the opportunity to hear something, what are they going to do with that information? There are some children who are really, really excited, and they want to please you. They want to give you the right answer all the time. So they will memorize and be good what I call students. Because they'll, I'll know the right answer. And if you see the kid that high wave, and you listen, you say, well, let somebody else answer. But he is like, I, am, I know. You want me to know. And then there's the other kid who doesn't raise his hand, but will ask the question, is that like, is that like when, is that what that means when my auntie says, 
So the idea is that they're putting some practicality to it. And if, you, are you, if you're still asking questions, the right answers, and not asking any questions, what does that mean to you, Tracy? What does that mean to you, Angela? When you hear that, what does that mean to you, George? When you don't ask those questions, that child, that child will never have a chance to shine. His talent won't show up. He will never soar. And then there's the other kid that said, but you can do it this way. So again, there's the consideration of who is in the room. But if you're asking the same question, the kid who says you can do it differently, who's quite creative, the kid who can do it and see practicality to it, are very different from the kid who knows it straight on. But we continue to ask the questions that do what? That straight on question. Think about it. If you were a wonderful singer or a ballerina and no one ever talked about music and ballet in front of you, you'd hide your talent. And all they talked about was engineering. It wouldn't fascinate you. You wouldn't so show up and soar. We need to spend more time understanding who is in the room and what do we do with that who. Make sense? It's really important if we don't spend the time asking those questions. And we only ask a few questions today. So when you go back to your place, if you go back to your classroom, spend the, the animated time, and I say animated time, because you're gonna have to wake kids up. What don't I know about you? Tell me what I, if we were doing this, what would make it easier for you to connect with? You have to ask the questions you think you know the answers to, and you have to ask the questions think, people think you shouldn't ask. You have to care more than people think you should care, because sometimes the data we collect says, oh, I can't do this right now. That's when you must do it. Because that's the opportunity that's gonna be missed if you don't make that sense. So when you think about it, it's all of our children, regardless of their dispositions, assumptions, beliefs, ability, data collected, learn together well. We use that famous word, inclusion. But if we don't ask who's in the room, we're truly excluding. We have to actively put thinking and implementation and actions together in order to get children in a place where it works for us. Because quite often, I don't care what the cognition is or the abilities are, but when I have 35 kids in a room who like the Detroit Lions, there's an engagement piece. There's an opportunity. And if they know the stats of all the individuals, that's my daily math problem, probability. And if they know the names, you're even further. So the key is that understanding who is in the room, what is the connection to who as it relates to your actions. So the idea is that creating an opportunity for every environment to be a rich environment for learning to happen. You're asking yourself, and I can see it in your head, so when do I have this opportunity? You must start today. And it must become an opportunity where you ask yourself, how, would I, how can I continuously tap into this knowledge? Sometimes it's having a conversation with someone you've never had a conversation with, or not having those conversations with people who bring you deficit ideas. Be careful, Tyrone is, what do you think he is? And the idea is that you have to let your, um, your understanding of who that child is bring his talent to the table. Question number two, what do we teach? You got your subjects in here. You know, there's, there's some science people in here. I know who you are. There's some math people in here. There's some wonderful literacy teachers in here who thinks words are the best thing. But everybody in here must be able to bring those words to life. No matter how much I like science, I can't create a great lab unless I can read that lab and follow those directions. No matter how much you love literature, you have to know the history of the situation in order to interpret why the literature was written. That's the connection. So the idea is not necessarily the data you want them to give you back, give back to you so that you know that you're right. We go back to that space where the relationship and the connections lead to what you teach. We've done some work with that this year. We've talked about what you want kids to know, what you want kids to understand, and what you want them to be able to do. And we spend an inordinate amount of time under looking at that big centerpiece, that understanding. Everything connects to that understanding. What you want kids to know and be able to do are only a reflection of what you want them to understand. What you want them to understand they can talk about for the rest of their lives. They'll make that connection every time it shows up in front of them. But if we don't spend the time 
figuring out what that is at the beginning of our teaching so they can grasp onto that, they're looking for right answers. And if that child has never had the right answers before in his life, he or she will think that those right answers will never show up on my paper. Quite often when we start to talk about assessment, I, I work with teachers and, and they'll say, how many, raise your hand if you got them all right. All right. And then there's Daquan in the back of the room who knows that he hasn't gotten any right. Are you gonna stand there and go through the list? When you see teachers do this, ask them, is this the best way to determine whether or not a child is connected or not? It's important for us to take those connections and make sense of it. Because what we want to do is, is this thinking that makes sense for us. So the idea of what we teach has to have a better grounding in what we want children to know for a lifetime. When you know something, you can repeat it. When you do something, you can replicate it, probably more than once. But when you understand something, you can talk to other people about it. And at the same time, share what you can do. What you want children to do to, is to have an opinion about what they know, not the right answer. We, I'm asking my teachers now, once they give you the right answers, say, why? How so? Is that true? And it's nothing but an extension of the same question you've been asking. Because that kid doesn't want to stop talking anyway. How often have you been in a room and they ask for brainstorming? You're not sure how to stop that process, particularly in kindergarten. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. But the idea is that you want that brainstorming to become a connection of how they think. And if you haven't actively put that activity or that implementation in a place, that brainstorming becomes an opportunity for children to become stifled. Again, every child is gifted, but you must give them the opportunity to see himself as fascinating. So the whole what piece becomes a connection to who and a connection to how. The whole what piece becomes a connection to who and comes to a connection to how. If we're teaching children who have no idea uh, about a content of a subject and we're trying to force them to know something without giving them an opportunity to say, what do you already know about this? We erode what we're teaching. It diminishes their ability to show up. So what you want them to do is at a low, minimum level. There's no high risk there. There's no, there's no ability for that child to see himself as fascinating because I haven't taken any risk. You know those children who will take risks. Those children who will blurt out their answer, wrong, right, or indifferent. I just want to hear myself. <laughs> That's the child that you want to work with. And, that, and not only working with him in a way, but working with him so you can figure out what that teaching is going to look like. So, and I know you, as we, as, we continue, as we have this conversation, you are tapping into individual minds that you work with this year. Your job is to expand that horizon. <coughs> work with teacher leaders to expand that. And ask yourself, I'm going to find five children fascinating that I didn't find fascinating last year. I'm going to let the data tell me one thing, and I'm going to implement another. I just need it as information. I don't need to nail him to the floor with a 60. I need to understand that the 60 is where he was at that point in time. That was the indicator at that point in time. But you have to figure out how do you find a child fascinating and gifted at any rung of the learning. It could be when it's a, it's a practical activity. Some of us are not creative, and some of us are not gifted until we're giving a creative moment. So is creativity being gifted, or is gifted being able to tap into the creativity? That's what happens when you have to ask yourself that question, and it lends itself in a bi-directional way. Think about the kid we just saw. You were like, yeah. But think about what's said about him when the test scores come out. Not that he has bad test scores. I'm just giving you usual and unusual suspects. I'm just giving you an opportunity to find something fascinating you didn't see fascinating before. So when, this, when you see this kid, you're going to say, oh, I saw you before. I see what you can do. And those are the things that's going to help him to be different in where you're looking for. So with that said, what does this mean? What do we teach in our classrooms? Do we teach what we want kids to know and be able to do? Or do we teach what we call these enduring understandings? 
I've been talking about this, this understanding that sends itself or spends itself a long time in front of you. How often do you spend time untapping that first? How do you plan? Do you start by looking at a book and say, oh, the kids need to know this, addition to column addition. They need to be able to know the functions of the feudal system. We need to be able to understand what does vanishing point mean. Those items do not make children talented. Those items do not create those children to be engaged. But giving them an opportunity to see their lives through their learning is what makes them engage. So when you're starting to ask yourself which one of these is, circles is more important to you, it's not about which one is more important. It's about tapping into each one equally. We spend a lot of time here. What you want children to know and be able to do. Because that's how we judge children. That's how we adjudicate it. That's how we evaluate it. That's the evidence we're looking for. But how often do we ask the question, what is your understanding? What is your next step? How do you know that this is going to be the right answer? And what is the evidence that that's the right answer? So with that said, it directly puts us in the how do you teach? Quite often, the how becomes these activities, these list of things I'm going to do in 42 minutes that show that he knows the right answer. Is that what we do? Is that what planning looks like? Or there's four of us together. I'm going to do this activity. You can do that activity. And it's a list of things that we do. And once we check them off, it's time to move to the next idea. But the how we teach is the integration of talent, understanding, and content. Talent, understanding, and content. And you, cannot, you, can't, you don't see the talent until you know who you're teaching. You don't see the understanding until you're unpacking what you're teaching. So now the how becomes, how do you implement this learning? Is it in large group? Is it in whole group? Is it in pairs? Is it individual? Do I have a flow in my classroom that says that I'm not going to spend the time lecturing, but I'm going to do small group to show evidence of learning? I'm going to do whole group to show evidence of accountability. Remember our diagram said earlier that that level of understanding and that connection to learning was when kids could make, take risk and express themselves and show engaging and endurement in classrooms. So when you take a look at this, how do you teach, you have to kind of create what we call a matrix of what's going to happen with the learning. What does that look like? Here's a suggested piece here. You've seen this before. When teachers come to the classroom, they have a well-developed understanding of content, process, and product. A well-developed understanding. But do you also have a well-developed understanding of readiness, interest, and learning? There must be a balance. Because if we worry about what we have here on this side, and, and not on the opposite side of looking at what does it mean to bring those together, you have an opportunity of, of creating a disconnect to what you want children to know, understand, and be able to do. As we take a look at this process, and we spend a lot of time, you know, because um, you yes, ask teachers, what do you teach? I teach biology. I teach science. I teach math. Content. Or is it process? Or well, I teach spelling test. You know, some, some of us will say the legislation many years ago was leave no child untested, not leave no child behind. <laughs> but whatever we called it, whatever we called the legislation, it was an opportunity to peek into the learning. It was an opportunity to peek into the understanding and connect it to where we were going with that. So you should ask yourself, am I going to teach this basically through this content level? But is this content at the readiness level of all of my children? Is this content in a place where children who are creative can get a connection here? Or is this content level in a place where I'm going to process it by small group? I want to be able to give an opportunity for children to shine in this position. But I have to choose the right opportunity to bring this to the table. You just can't say this is Differentiated Wednesday. <laughs> You can actually have the opportunity of creating an opportunity. Oh, have we had that before? So the opportunity is to develop a process that shows a content connection. I was working with a teacher recently in this district, and, and she had quite a few uh, young, young men in the room. So the, the idea was that the sports piece would come out. The connection was, I think, they actually had the, even the soap had a little coat that had a, a, a jersey on it. But these kids were connected, and the learning was actually connected where they were at that time. 
So if, when you take a look at readiness and you unpack this readiness, because it's not where the test score says he is, it's his, it's his, his understanding to unpack data without you applying treatment. And then once you learn where that uh, position is, then you apply the treatment. Even your physician who's a great practitioner says, what's wrong with you? You know, he doesn't say, if you were just a little bit thinner, we'd have a better patient-doctor relationship. He won't do that. He'll treat you where you are. And the idea is that when we see kids and when they come to us, we teach the children that we have, not the ones we want or not the ones we wish we had. You know, Miss Jones always gets the good kids. Your job is to find your children fascinating. So at some point, that child is a good kid based on what you've decided to do with that child. And then you share that good news. So this how becomes a matrix. And the other piece that makes sense for us is to unpacking the planning so that planning is what we call connected, intentful, and deliberate. It's not a list of activities that somebody did last year that you're going to replicate. Well, it's not even the list of activities that you did last year that you're going to replicate. Because if you think about it, if your doctor did that, well, I'm going to treat you like I did the last patient. It seemed to work for that patient. But the idea, it must be individual. It must be their level of fascination that you find in a place where you're going to unpack it in a way that makes sense for them. My last question is that what is the evidence of learning? When a child can share with you what he knows and what he can do, there must be a level of expression that's free for him or her to express. Yes, you can decide what kind of assessment it will look like. You can decide if it's a Freer model. You can decide if it's a, a completion test. You can decide if it's, a, if it's an, a, long, a long reading assignment with a long writing assignment. But I'm finding teachers looking at children as these opportunities to, no, no, show me what you can do. And they get excited about that. I watch quite often when children and teachers say, well, how do you want to interpret this? Show me in a rap. And I was like, you know, does that teacher really know what a rap does? But she'll ask the kid to rap the answer, or he'll ask the kid to rap the answer. The teacher gets fascinated by what she hears, but there's no connection to where that rap should go. Granted, the state test will never have a wrap on it. <laughs> but it will have the ability to take that five sentence paragraph and to take it into another level of thinking. So once he's wrapped it, written it down, how does it look in a five sentence paragraph that has a topic sentence and a closing sentence? That's when it becomes equitable. That's when it comes equal for children because you're starting where the child is. So the level of evidence of learning doesn't look the same for everyone. It comes right back to our diagram here. That level of learning has to be a position where you have to decide what is it going to look like here. Because quite often when someone comes to your classroom and to identify engagement, is it because all the children are quiet and they're reading? Or is it because all the children are yelling and trying to figure out what the right answer is? Engagement has to be unpacked in a different way for every classroom. As my teacher leaders start to visit other classrooms, you're going to see that's different. You're going to see that they're doing things very differently. And it's going to be expected to do that in all classrooms. As you start to lead instruction in your room, you're going to start to lead instruction in a very different way because you have to ask yourself these questions. And when you start to ask yourself these questions, you're going to have to give yourself some answers that's going to cause you to implement in a very different way. If you think back to our vocalist earlier today, he just said, I'm going to share with you a continuation that means he's done it before. And, he, and at the end, he signs off with the high line, peace. I've done my best. I want to share it with you. And there it is. It's up to us to decide how we want to, to relish that. Does he now become a leader of a small group? Because he now has the ability to. But this, uh, this may be a kid in the room who doesn't want to talk. You've got to figure out how to develop that talent. It's a piece of research I'm doing with a friend of mine that we look at. And we ask ourselves, how do children look in one aspect of teaching and when they're seen in another aspect of teaching? We're asking teachers to become more coaches because there are three things that happen in coaching realms where children don't often get in classrooms. They know the outcome. They know what the end result is. And every coaching situation is to win the pennant. Regardless of what we're doing, we're going to win the pennant. If a child doesn't know at the end of this semester that I need to be 78% and I'm at 68%, if he or she doesn't know that, 
you haven't informed that. So you can't coach that situation. You're coaching frustration. The other thing is that in a coaching situation, the coach knows what to practice. Everybody doesn't get the same homework. Everybody doesn't take the same homework down to home. So if I'm a kid who can already do my multiplication tables, two columns and three columns, is that what I'm gonna practice at home? You've heard me tell the story. I have a niece who's autistic. She's very good at math. Found my her teacher could find out she could do math very well. What did she do now? She increased the amount of homework. Suddenly my niece no longer liked mathematics because homework was from 6.15 to 6.45. And at 6.45 it was bath time. But at 6.45 she was still doing math. So she now became disinterested in mathematics, what we thought her talent was. So we have to make sure she has less problems that go deeper so she can think more about what she's doing. The approach is very different. So your opportunity is to spend time unpacking who that child is so you can figure out what to teach. And the idea is that you have to practice very differently. Watch your athletes out here on the field. You have a very robust athletic program here. Everybody's practicing something different because they've been coached to tell them what they need to practice. And believe it or not, when they come back to, as a team, everybody knows what to do. So have you coached your children individually on their talents so when they come back as a whole group, you can now show them as a team of learners? Think about it. Our children do not have the ability to act as collective learners because we don't treat them as collective learners. How often do you give them a chance to solve a problem as a whole group versus an individual? Sometimes people need to look on while they're doing something. And that's not a bad thing. That's collaboration. The key is that now you have to innovate and show new ideas once that's actually happened. And as we start to unpack these children and see, and see how it looks for us, the last thing is that you need them to do in this coaching situation is to know that when I fail, I am not a failure. This is an opportunity for feedback and new directions. We gotta start saying that. Assi assessment is not to gather a grade, but to give proper feedback in next directions. Because if a kid doesn't know what that 78 means, he's going to think he's 78% into the next testing opportunity. And that's a bad place to feel if everybody else is getting 100s and 90s. But if I know that 78 has me here, and I have to move in this direction to be more successful, and the feedback you're giving is just for me in time, that's what learning looks like. So the evidence of learning has to come from us giving more information, asking more questions, and setting ourselves in a trajectory where we see ourselves moving in a place where children are going to be successful. I'm talking about kindergartners as well as 12th graders. Everybody needs feedback. As your teacher leaders start working together, your feedback is going to have to be for teachers to improve the things that they're doing. How are you going to unpack and say that? I need you to start thinking differently about Rocky because he has this type of learning opportunity. So when we take a look at this, you ask yourself, how is this going to impact student learning? It impacts student learning in, in a way it becomes more clear. It's like a laser. No longer am I treating sprinkling information and hoping that it will happen. I'm very clear. I'm very deliberate, and I'm very intentful about the learning that has to happen. And it's all because my actions have changed. The doctor may ask you to do some things, but he has to be the pivotal practitioner when he treats you first. You have to know who's in the room. You have to know what's wrong, what's, what the idea is for the patient, and how are you going to treat it. And then you got to measure what were the outcomes once you did that. So we've got to push ourselves to be more like coaches, ladies and gentlemen. And once we do that, the first thing we'll do is treat people more individually in their learning. One more piece I want to share with you. It's important for us to understand that if we don't have an idea to un understand how we unpack this in a systemic way so that assessment becomes the driver and not the in only the indicator. Assessment drives us to do something differently. Assessment will say that what did I do to create an opportunity for learning. And where are my children in that opportunity to learn? Not a collection. One of the smartest children I've ever seen in my life was one of my AP biology students. And he said, Dr. Parker, I'm okay with your teaching. 
but you collect all my, mistake, my, all my mistakes, average them together, and then tell me how bad I am. When are you going to tell me how good I am? And that was because I was collecting grades. I wasn't giving feedback on assessments. And this kid saw himself as a deficit. He believed that I saw him as a deficit. Fortunately, this child is a very good physician today. Would want him to be my physician if he could. But the idea is that the opportunity for this child to learn was important for him. And he wanted to know what does that look like for us. So assessment is not just a set of ongoing collection pieces of data, but they inform through feedback and instruction. And ask yourself, when have you given some good feedback before? Or is your feedback just a smiley face? Or excellent underlying? Was it on the wall of fame in your room? Sometimes it's about taking a post-it and writing, Johnny, 78. We're looking at an 88 next time. This is where we're going to start. Few words, but it means a lot to Johnny. It means a lot to Becky when they know that you've taken the time. And as you push, when you find kids are more responsible, you ask them for feedback, and that give you feedback. So when, they, when the folder goes out with the feedback, you, they have to write you something back. I agree, this is what I need to do. Then and only then will children become engaged in their learning. And the assessments become the building blocks for the very next step. So the new idea today is not to only think about what we want kids to know and be able to do. Because once we do that, we've covered it. And when someone, somebody says you've covered it, what do you do with it? There you go, you leave it alone, you move on. That's my permission to move on. But it's actually a third dimension. It is important to know the facts and the skill sets of what you want them to do, but it's also a set of concepts that make the real, the learning real time for children. And then and only then will they become engaged and the knowledge will be retained. Those are the questions we must ask. First, who is in the room? And you must find that who in the room fascinating. On your watch, don't depend on anybody else telling, yeah, he's fascinating. But also figure out what you're going to teach so it shows relationships over a period of time. And then figure out how you're going to implement that learning. How do you make it live long in their minds and in their hearts? Our vocalist earlier, that song meant something to him. I'm not even sure if he understood the words, but the motion that he had, the emotions that he had, it, rel it, it, it resonated in his heart. And you became more fascinated because you saw how deeper he became in that learning. When does it happen for you in social studies with children? Or is it just the capitals of the states? You have to make the learning relevant to children so that this shows up. And I'm going to leave you with our main, this is where we're going to leave you. Where are you on the continuum? Are you spending time developing your mindset so that you can figure out who's in the room? Are you spending time unpacking the what so we can figure out what the matrix looks like when you're trying to plan? And do you find new ways of providing evidence of learning? Because the easiest question to ask a child is once he gives you the right answer is, how so? Hope this was helpful for you. Gave you an opportunity to take a look at new questions. So in order to improve student learning, you have to ask more questions. Thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Parker. And I want to thank all of you here because all of you, regardless of what role you serve in the district at this moment, we're on a continuum of providing the most quality education we can for our children, understanding who they are, understanding what we need to do to ensure that they are learning optimally. And I want to also thank Dr. Parker because he's been a part of this whole equation uh, as we have been moving instruction forward in the district and will continue to support us. So again, thank you and thank you. And we'll see you at the next Southfield Public Schools TED Talk. <laughs>